Okay, hello everybody. So uh, today we're going to talk of um, the um, some other new consequences, well, new in the sense that new to our course, of course, uh, of special relativity. Um, we're going to talk of uh, mass, energy, and momentum in special relativity. Uh, I suppose you remember how mass was varying with velocity, right? So uh, in uh, unlike in classical mechanics where you know, if you, uh, whatever the mass of a body is, if you move, if the body moves, uh, its mass doesn't change. But here, of course, we have this concept of what a rest mass is and the fact that you are in a frame which is moving with some, uh, you know, some uniform velocity with something else. And in a sense, the mass itself is moving with certain velocity, then you do find that the mass of the body has changed. Well, we did um, see some consequences of that. Um, today, what we're going to do is um, relate this, the relate the mass that is, to the total energy, and also with the momentum. Okay. Now, having said, talked of mass and energy, I mean, uh, it's uh, very certain that we're going to talk of E is equal to m c squared. Uh, we're going to spend some time to see how this comes about. It's, I suppose, one of the uh, most um, well-known equations in physics. Anybody who has uh, even opened a textbook in physics or about read about scientists and what, what, what physics is has heard about this equation. So today what we are going to do is to see in a simple way how to derive this from uh, principles which are known to us. Okay. So uh, first, uh, you know, let's consider a force which is being applied to body, and uh, uh, when uh, when you know when this force acts, uh, what happens is that it displaces the body by an amount by a small amount uh, dx, let's say, in time uh, dt. Okay, so the small displacement dx and that too in the direction of the force. So why? So if you take the dot product, you know, if you just take, you don't need to take the vector part. It's such f dx. Okay, um, and then it also happens in some small time dt, right? So, what happens? I mean, what happens when one applies this force? Well, the body starts moving. I mean, if the body was initially at rest and then after the application of the force, it attains a, a velocity v, let's say small v then uh, what would be the uh, total gain in the kinetic energy of the body? Well, by definition, it is the work done, is not it? I mean, so that is the energy that, um, uh, that the kinetic energy that the body has gained uh, once it reaches uh, a final velocity v from its initial rest position. Okay. And what, what is that? So that is integration of f dx. Okay. Of course, well, in a, in a proper sense, one should have taken the vector f dot dx, but as we said, um, the displacement is in the direction of the force, so it hardly matters here. Now, the interesting point here is that we write this force now in terms of the rate of change of momentum. Okay, just see the region next to f dx, and you see that it is um, under the integral sign you have dp dt, so that p being the momentum gained. Okay, and dx is a displacement anyway. So how do you write this momentum? You know that momentum is the mass times the velocity. So we write d of dt of mv. Okay, and then for dx, we just write v dt. Now why is that? So uh, you know v being the velocity of the body, that's equal to dx by dt, and then we have just replaced um, dx as v dt, right? So how does uh, I mean what does the uh, uh, the equation for the uh, the expression for the kinetic energy boils down to? Well, it's as we said. I mean we are finding the gain in the kinetic energy when uh, the particle is uh, you know from has moved from its rest position to its um, and and has attained the final velocity v. It's the integral within the limits zero to v, v being the final velocity gained. 
and then the integrand is v of d of m v. Now, check that here we have not talked of whether m is constant or not. Okay. So, this uh, form of the kinetic energy is very standard. We can use it uh, for example, let us let us why do not we use it to find uh, the uh, non relativistic uh, equation, uh, non relativistic expression for the kinetic energy that will uh, clarify the situation a bit. So, for the non relativistic case, what do we do? Uh, here we we know that you know mass of a body is constant, I mean it is a fixed thing. So, we can take it out of the differential d of m v, take it out of the integral sign. So, that the integration of for the kinetic energy is simply v d v and then from 0 to the final velocity at the end. It is a very simple integration to do, uh, the, inti uh, the integration um, the integral rather becomes v square by 2, you know v d v 0 to v that becomes v square by 2. So, the total kinetic energy is nothing but half m v square. Now, this is a known expression to us, I mean, uh, we know this expression half m v square it is it's, it's used almost everywhere in classical physics, classical mechanics by the way. So, um, of course, what have we done here? We have taken the mass to be a constant thing, so as expected. Now, what happens to the relativistic case? In the relativistic case, remember that the mass is indeed a function of velocity. Okay? So, if the mass of course moves, uh, if, if the body moves with a certain velocity, uh, with a large velocity, we do see actually you know large as compared to what? I mean if it is of course all velocities we are we will be considering is less than the speed of light, but then if it is approaching the speed of light, we do see that the mass has in increased by a lot. Okay? Of course, I mean when we are at very low speeds, uh, it does not matter, okay? so we are still in the non relativistic limit. But then we have appreciable speeds, then we do start feeling that uh, the mass of the body has increased. Okay? So, what happens if we consider that? So, uh, the mass of a body being a function of the velocity now, okay? then we can no longer take the, um, like take the, the mass or the m out of the differential and then we have to use the entire thing. Okay? Now, what would be the expression? Okay, you are going to put in the exact value of the momentum or the exact value of the mass here that is m0 divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square of course the v is there okay so the kinetic energy and what is m0 here m0 is the rest mass okay that's the mass of the body that's measured when the body is at rest okay so what's the expression for the kinetic energy then well it's v times d of m0 v divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. Okay? Now, uh, this might look like a bit complicated, but uh, we do have uh, a thing called integration by parts in mathematics. And so, I think it is a proper case to utilize such a trick. Okay? So, what is this integration by parts? So, it is that if you have an integration of x dy, and then you can write this as you know and then y is some complicated function that you have. So, it is nothing but x y minus of integral of y dx. Okay? Now, what we do is that we identify x as the velocity here and then for y we take uh, you know it is m times that is the momentum. So, m times v that is nothing but m 0 v divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. Okay, so, let us just do this integration and then get the result. Um, if you are interested in the uh, algebra of it, I am going to spend one more slide on it. So, just to show you some of the steps. Okay. So, uh, one or two slides that is. So, the integration that we are going to do is, is the one written at the uh, bottom of your screen. Okay. So, uh, that is the uh, expression for the uh, relativistic case when mass is a function of velocity. So, the kinetic energy happens to be m 0 v square divided by 1 minus v square by c square square root of that minus of m 0 and then we take the integral of v dv divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. 
So, if you do this integral and then put in the proper limits, okay, uh, you know, just look at the second line. So, when you do the integral and put in the proper limits, so you get the one that is given in the brackets there, that is m0 c square divided by uh, into root over of 1 minus v square by c square and then the limits from 0 to v. And then the whole expression simplifies, so whole expression for the kinetic energy simplifies into two parts. See that it simplifies into an expression for the mass of a body which is moving with a certain velocity v times c square. Why the mass of the body being m0 uh, divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square, that is the total mass of a body when it is moving a certain velocity v that is multiplied by c square minus then m0, then m0 is what? m0 is just the rest mass okay, of the body times c square, c being the velocity of light. Okay. So, that is what we have, that is the total uh, kinetic energy of the body. Okay. Now, um, kinetic energy of the body being that, uh, we can interpret the uh, total energy of the body as something like m0 divided by root over 1 minus v square by c square okay, times the c square. Okay. So, that being that will be then equal to m0 c square, uh, we call it as the rest mass energy if we consider m c square as the total energy plus the kinetic energy. Okay. If that sounds a bit confusing, it might a little bit. Let us just have a look at the next slide and that will clarify our concept. What is it? So, at rest, when the body is at rest, we know that the kinetic energy is 0, okay. but what happens to the total energy? Remember, if you go back to our old slide, if you go back to our old slide, we see that when the body is at rest, the total kinetic energy is 0, but the total energy is still m0 c square when the body is at rest. So, that justifies the word, uh, that justifies the term rest mass energy. That is the uh, intrinsic energy associated with the body even when it is at rest. So, when the body starts moving, the total energy would be this intrinsic rest mass energy plus whatever kinetic energy the body has gained. So, that will be then the total energy. Okay. So, that is exactly what we meant by saying that we interpret the total energy as m c square and m being m 0 divided by 1 minus v square by c square. Okay. So, having known uh, this concept of what a rest mass energy is, let us just write that as E 0 okay, just to signify that it is you know the rest frame of the body or the energy of the body when the body is at rest. So, as you said, what is the total um, energy of the body when the uh, object is moving? It will be E and uh, that will be equal to E0 times plus the kinetic energy that is. And what is that? That is nothing but m0 root over 1 minus v square by c square times c square. Okay? And what is that? That is simply m c square, where m is the relativistic mass. Okay? So, you see how this E equal to m c square has come about. Okay? Now, of course, this is a profound result. I mean, it has not only altered physics, it has altered the world actually. Okay? So, it is the first time you are seeing that, you know, the intrinsic mass is being related with the energy of the body and it has immense consequences in fields of, in other br branches of physics. Okay. For example, if we consider um, the energy production in the sun, for example, uh, their uh, energy is being produced by, by uh, fusing hydrogen into helium. Okay. So, when you, so, if you add up the masses of hydrogen and you add up the masses of helium, okay, you would find that uh, in the final product, the total mass is not the same. I mean, the whatever you started, the total amount of hydrogen. Um, you know the total mass of the hydrogen you started okay, and the total mass of helium that is produced, you will see it is less. So, where has this mass gone into? Well, this mass has been converted into energy. Okay. So, hydrogen is being fused into helium 
and then some amount of energy is released okay and that's the uh, and that's the source of uh, that well that's more or less the you know the source of energy production in the sun and to, just to give you an example uh, you know just to feel of the numbers or the amount of energy that's uh, uh, being converted uh, from matter uh, per second okay uh, about uh, about 4.4 .4 into 10 to the power 9 kilograms of matter is being converted to energy per second in the sun okay so how are you going to find the total energy released per second that's the total power actually so you're going to multiply this number 4.4 .4 into 10 to the power 9 okay kg per second into 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second square okay uh, meter per second that is i'm sorry meter per second and uh, you take the square of that and what do you find you would find that uh, the total um, energy is nothing but uh, 4 into 10 to the power 26 joule per second okay now if you just consider per thousand watt bulb okay I, I, I remember if nobody uses thousand watt bulbs in the their homes anymore you would rather use more efficient sources okay but let's you know how how bright a thousand watt bulb can be okay that's 10 to the power 3 okay that's 10 to the power 3 watts um, if you divide 4 into 10 to the power 26 by 20 to the power 3 it's not it's nothing but 4 into 10 to the power 23 so per second you know, the sun is shining like 4 into 10 to the power 23 thousand watt bulbs you just have a feel when I just have a feeling of how large this power is. Well, actually, this is also uh, an important lesson for us to utilize the solar energy in, uh, in our daily lives. I mean, it'll um, you know if you work more on research in solar energy and try to harness this energy, which is just coming to us free from the sun, uh, lots of this energy problem will be solved. Okay, so. I think you know appreciate how how this uh, e equal to m c square comes about and uh, what the consequences of it are. Okay, of course I didn't so far talk about uh, nuclear fusion of you uh, you know in a very direct way. I didn't talk of nuclear fusion, but then I gave you an example of uh, fusion of hydrogen to helium in stars. Okay, but some other applications in nuclear physics. Uh, let's see if we can do such things a little bit later. Okay, so having talked of energy and mass, let's see um, what the uh, expression for the kinetic energy, I mean whatever things that we have uh, discussed so far, whether it actually boils down to, uh, to our known relativist and non-relativistic formulae if we take uh, velocities um, less much much less than the velocity of light so let's check if um, our the uh, mass times the energy uh, uh, you know mass times uh, the uh, speed of light squared uh, from where uh, from um, from you know we have derived the kinetic energy let's see whether we can uh, get the proper limit here okay so we know the expression for the kinetic energy that's the total energy minus the rest mass energy of a body okay now since we know that uh, the velocity that we are considering here is much much less than the velocity of light so we can uh, we do an approximation here we do a binomial expansion of 1 minus v square by c square to the power minus half here okay that's the denominator of m0 c square divided by root over 1 minus v square by c square what is that well the first term is 1 plus you know, the term of importance half times v square by c square so you plug this in the expression for the kinetic energy okay it becomes 1 plus half v square by c square times m0 c square 
course and then you subtract m0 c square from here okay what do you get it's very simple you get half m0 v square okay so indeed since the mass of the body does not change in, uh, in non relativistic uh, uh, classical physics, it is um, half m v squared and then m being the rest mass, uh, rest mass of the body. Okay. So, we do see that um, it um, reduces to the classical limit at low speeds. Okay. So, having talked of uh, mass energy and then seen and then having seen that it actually does give us the uh, proper uh, limit of the kinetic energy at low speeds, let us now move a bit and bring in the momentum. Okay, remember we started this, uh, this, uh, this module by talking of mass, energy and momentum. Let us talk of energy and momentum. Okay. So, how are they related? Well, you, you have you know from your previous slides here that the total energy is m0 divided by 1 minus v square by c square times c square that is mc square. What is the momentum? Well, that is m times v, m being your fa uh, familiar m0 divided by 1 minus v square by c square. Okay. Uh, well, but looking at these two expressions mathematically, you see that you know the mass portion remains this remains uh, the same, but then you know the only thing different is the c square for the energy part and the velocity v for the uh, uh, momentum part. So what will happen if we you know try to put them together on the same footing? Okay, what happens? For example, if we just do e square minus p square c square. So what we do is that we square the energy. And then from that, we subtract p square times c square. Okay. Now you will check that, of course, that will have the um, that will have the um, uh, that will have the dimension of the energy square. Okay. But what is it? What well, does it give us? Something very interesting. Actually, it does. I mean, if you, if you do the um, algebra, it's a rather one or two line algebra. You will see that it's nothing but when you do e square that is the total energy and the, from that you subtract, subtract p square that is the momentum squared times the velocity of light squared. You are going to get something very interesting. You are going to get m0 c square whole of that square of that whole square of that that is. So that is nothing but the rest mass squared okay, of the body. Okay. So if the body um, has a total energy e and it is also having total momentum p, uh, it is it is moving with a certain momentum p, then e square minus p square c square is nothing but the rest mass square of the body. It is an interesting concept actually, it is a because what it tells you is that uh, this, this group of variables e square minus p square c square remains invariant in all reference frames. Of course, these reference frames are moving with uh, constant velocity with respect to each other. Okay. So that is what we have, we have e square minus p square c square to remain invariant. Okay. Now well that was, um, that was, that was, that has the dimension of uh, energy squared. Actually it need not be, I mean we, we were also having momentum. Okay. So we could also in a sense have this as the dimension of momentum square. Well, that is very simple. All you do is that you divide uh, the entire stuff by c squared and then you have e squared by c squared minus p squared and then the invariant quantity will come out to be m0 squared c squared. Now, remember m0 is the rest mass of the body and c of course is the velocity of light. Okay, And this has the dimension of m0 c that is has the dimension of momentum and then m0 square c square has the dimension of momentum square. Okay. So, we are going to spend some time on this relation okay, and then find out certain interesting things. But before that, let us continue a bit on, on these units. Okay. Remember in, 
in relativity and in like other um, domains of physics, we are, we are quite interested in, in units in which you, you measure everything in terms of uh, something, you know, in terms of the units of energy, okay. In atomic physics, for example, the unit of energy is generally electron volt. Nuclear physics, MeV, okay, million electron volt. So, what is that? What is EV? So, EV is nothing but the energy gained by an electron accelerated through a potential difference of 1 volt, okay. So, if you take a million times of this, that is 10 to the power 6 EV, that gives you uh, MeV. And then when you take 10 to the power 9, that is 1 billion EV, you get 1 GeV, that is a giga electron volt, okay, that being the unit of energy. What about the mass? Well, normally you would measure everything in grams or kilograms, kilograms is CSI unit, okay. So, however, if you, if you, if you consider the expression E is equal to mc squared, you can uh, very well measure mass in terms of energy by c squared. Then you can measure mass everything in terms of, in example, like MeV by c squared or EV by c squared or GeV by c squared, okay. So, that actually helps a lot. So, what about the, um, you know, what about the, expect, what about the unit for the um, momentum, okay, mass times the velocity. If we measure velocity in terms of the, uh, you know, how much of it is a, a percentage of velocity of light. So, if it is MeV by C square, then you multiply by C, it should be MeV by C or, or something like energy by C. Well, that is, that is very, um, that is very normal because if you just consider uh, uh, E square is equal to P square C square plus M0 square C to the power 4, then the momentum does turn out to be uh, energy by C, okay. And then you can, you can measure it in terms of MeV by C or let us say the GeV by C if it is an ultra relativistic uh, momentum that you are considering. Okay, now let us consider something else, one, one other application, okay. Uh, it is uh, whether one can have massless particles, okay. And uh, I, I see this as an application of, um, of, of relativity, we are going to realize that in classical mechanics, we kind of never ask such a question. Okay, why? Because, well, once you have a massless particle, uh, you do not have, you have matter which is massless. Well, in classical mechanics, such a thing does not exist at all because you see, if you have a, something massless, I mean, what is massless in classical mechanics? Nothing. I mean, you consider unless, um, you know, you have an object which, which is a material matter, then you say it is massless. Of course, then object is not there, okay. So, but in any case, if you want to take this argument a little bit further, if you m is 0, the momentum is 0, the energy is 0. So, such a question does not happen, that does not arise at all. So, massless particle cannot exist in, uh, in, uh, in classical physics or in, or in, in a, in a non-relativistic situation. However, in relativistic situation, do we have a massless particle to exist? Does it, you know, well, it's it's more like in classical physics, it forbids the existence of massless particle. But does relativity forbid such an existence? Okay, let's let's just check it out. Well, well, if indeed the rest mass is zero, you would find the total mass to be zero if velocity is less than c. Why? Because m0 is 0 and the denominator is 1 minus v square by c square is finite and then that is, uh, so the total mass m is 0. And then immediately you are going to figure out that the momentum is 0 and the energy of course is 0, fine. So, if the uh, rest mass of a body is indeed 0 and it is moving with a velocity less than the velocity of light, then massless particle should not exist, okay. But what happens if we still have uh, the rest mass to be 0, but the particle is moving with the velocity of light itself, okay. It is strange, isn't it? So, then what you see 
is that the expression for the momentum and the energy becomes 0 by 0, it is an indeterminate form, okay, it is an indeterminate, you cannot determine, it is 0 by 0 form. So, it is basically you cannot say that it is 0, neither can you say it is actually infinite, it is actually indeterminate, it can have any value, okay. So, in a sense, relativity does not forbid the existence of massless particle if, and in this case and only if, it moves with the velocity of light, okay. So, that is a very important conclusion that you can draw. It is that massless particle will be existing only and they will have energy and momentum provided they travel at the speed of light, okay. Well, actually, can you, can you, can you name such a thing? Huh? Exactly, you can. It is called the photon, okay. You know, it is the quanta of light, okay. Then how are the energy and momentum related in this case, well, since the rest mass is 0, then energy is equal to p times the velocity of light here, it is e times p, because otherwise e square is equal to p square c square plus m naught square c per 4. So, the m naught square being 0, so you have e square is equal to p square c square and here, so e is equal to p into c, that is what, okay. Okay, so that is an important conclusion that we have in special relativity, okay. Okay, so now let us uh, change tack a little bit and uh, return back to our energy momentum relation and see something quite interesting, okay. So, what do we have here? We have basically E square by C square minus the, uh, the momentum square. Remember this what we write as the small p, that is the 3 momentum, okay. That is equal to m0 square c squared and then I write that as capital P square just to um, you know give you an idea that um, the invariant quantity that you have has a dimension of momentum. What kind of momentum is that? It is definitely not the 3 vector momentum that we do in, uh, in, in our daily lives, okay. So, that is what I said. So, uh, the uh, capital P here has uh, the dimension of momentum uh, momentum, and then uh, P square of course has the dimension of momentum squared here. It is different from small p. Now, what is small p? Now, small p is let us say it is the momentum, well it is the 3 momentum of a particle, okay. Now, if you take the 3 momentum squared, so, well, the norm of the momentum, I put a vector sign on top of small p. What does it mean? It means that you take a dot product p dot p, small p dot small p. Then what does it turn out to be? It is nothing but p1 squared plus p2 squared plus p3 squared. If I write, for example, px squared plus py squared plus pz squared in Cartesian coordinates and that is invariant. You know that because that is equal to the length of a vector that is invariant, okay. Even if you rotate the vector, the, le the length remains the same. So, the vector, the 3 vector is the one in which we put the vector sign and then we have 3 components, so there are 3 independent components, okay. Now, check that the momentum or the, uh, you know, we can define a 4 momentum which uh, capital P who's, uh, which has of course 4 components and to keep in, uh, you know, in uh, in consonance with the 3 momentum that we had earlier, P1, P2, P3, which is denoted by uh, vector P. We have the first part as P0. Um, we just call this at the 0th component of the 4 momentum, okay. And then if we define something like uh, the 4 momentum dot product, I have put the dot product in inverted commas and then you have put a bigger dot, okay, P, P big dot P, okay, and all the capital P's. Then we define that as P0 squared minus P dot P, the vector P dot vector P. Then we can get something quite interesting. Actually, we can relate uh, what we have found here with the energy momentum uh, in special relativity. So, if you identify P0 as E by C, okay, and so the total P becomes uh, the capital, so the capital P becomes E by C and then the other vector is the uh, 3 vector. Then um, the, uh, 
you know the 4 vector dot product becomes e squared by c squared minus small p squared and we know that that is invariant ok. Now, just like the uh, dot product of a vector was indeed invariant here too the dot product or the big dot product of the 4 vector is also invariant ok. So, there is something which is happening here I mean so uh, I think if you if you have not got it in these 2 slides do not worry I am going to talk a little bit more about the 4 vectors and space time a little bit later ok. So, I just want to tell you that there is something uh, interesting that you can relate uh, this energy momentum with things called the 4 vectors ok. Let us uh, see what that is ok. Well, to change stack yet again and uh, do a little bit of formal stuff in terms of uh, uh, Minkowski we are doing relativity one does relativity in terms of uh, Minkowski space time remember in in special relativity. So, it is not only the um, space part, but we also have the time part which is uh, which is equally important here. So, because here uh, time is no longer an independent uh, quantity it also depends on uh, uh, the uh, space quantities that is what we saw uh, in, in our Lorentz transformations ok. So, if you define a quantity uh, ok an event let us say or the world point by 4 space time coordinates ok. Since the uh, velocity of light is uh, c which is uh, constant in all frames. So, what we have here is that uh, we take capital X as uh, you know C t and then x y z. So, why have we taken C t? So, that we preserve the same dimension as the space coordinates ok. Or you could even have make it look like uh, you know you just say you have 4 coordinates x 0, x 1, x 2, x 3 and then x 0 is the 0 th in a sense 0 th component of uh, the um, the uh, the the thing called x capital x here and then small x1 x2 x3 these are the uh, space coordinates ok so that's what we said x0 is equal to ct and then uh, the vector x is x1 x2 x3 or xyz if you wish in cartesian coordinates ok now what's the uh, squared norm of this quantity uh, as we had defined it is c square t square minus x 1 square minus x 2 square minus x 3 square ok. So, it is nothing but c square t square minus uh, vector uh, small x dot vector small x ok. So, what do we have? So, what we have is that in S frame if we have a point which is denoted by you know one of these world space time events uh, denoted by uh, c t um, x y z ok. So, a certain event is occurring at a certain time in a certain uh, position in space. Now, the same event will be viewed by someone in the s prime frame which is moving with the velocity v with respect to the s frame as c t prime um, and at, at time t prime that is and then the po at, at position x prime y prime z prime ok. Remember at t equal to and t equal to t prime is equal to 0 this 2 frames were uh, you know coinciding and then it started uh, with the movement velocity uh, uniform velocity v that is ok. So, how are these things related? So, uh, these quantities are actually related by Lorentz transformations ok. So, what is x prime? Well, x prime is nothing but I mean if you use uh, the notations gamma and beta remember we had used uh, you know we, had, we are using them so that uh, um, the expressions become less cumbersome ok. So, beta being v by c ok and then gamma becomes 1 minus beta square uh, what the root over or, or, or to the power minus half basically 1 by root over a 1 minus v square by c square. Okay, since we are moving um, uniformly along uh, 
S prime frame is moving uniformly along the common x x prime axis and uh, so what is x prime? So x prime is nothing but in terms of um, the x quantities, it is gamma times x minus beta c t okay and y prime of course is equal to y and then um, z prime is z and then c t prime is gamma c t minus beta x okay fine. So, what happens um, to, um, to the quantity um, capital X prime okay. So, if you do c square t square minus x square minus y square minus z square you should check that this becomes equal to c square t prime square minus x prime square minus y prime square minus z prime square. So, the uh, norm of the quantity x okay capital X that is of the four vector remains invariant whether you are doing it in the um, S frame or the S prime frame okay. So, that is what we have and uh, in fact that gives us the idea that if we have uh, if we can if you can figure out a set of four quantities of four numbers that uh, transform as the uh, components of the four vector x okay capital x that is uh, they will be four vectors okay so and then not only that i mean just just about any four quantities will not be uh, any four numbers you just clump them together they'll not be four vectors well their component should transform like the components of the uh, space time coordinate capital X okay uh, which is basically they should transform by the same Lorentz transformation. Not only that the norm of the four vector that one has constructed should be invariant under any frame okay. To give an example just think of any other um, four vector let us say a general four vector uh, some vector A. Okay, remember since I am using the word 4 vector and not a 3 vector that is what I have not put a vector sign on top of A or capital A that is. So, in the S frame that is it has components A0, Ax, Ay, Az and in the um, S prime frame it has components A0 prime, A1, X, Ax prime, Ay prime and Az prime and that is the vector um, A prime okay that is the 4 vector A prime. Now, if A is a 4 vector in S frame okay and um, S prime is the 4 vector seen from uh, rather A prime is the same 4 vector seen from the S prime frame then there are certain conditions that should be obeyed. Well, first of all uh, the components of A and the components of A prime should be related by the Lorentz transformation okay and not only that um, the uh, squared norm of um, A and A prime they should be equal and it is actually Lorentz invariant okay fine. So, that is exactly what we had for our energy and momentum if we define the four momentum as E by C and uh, uh, that is the uh, zeroth part and then the other three parts uh, are the, are the uh, familiar three momentum vectors okay let us say the three linear momentum P x P y P z. So, if capital P that is the uh, four momentum vector in S frame which, ha which has components E by C and P x P y P z and then the same thing seen from uh, the prime frame is uh, capital P prime and that is E prime by C uh, P x prime P y prime and P z prime the small P x prime P y prime P z prime that is the um, uh, three momentum vector in the prime frame. Then uh, the components of P and P prime are related by none other than the Lorentz transformations. Well, this has um, immense consequences actually because in a sense uh, this will help us in uh, uh, relating the energy and momentum in one frame 
with the energy and momentum in another frame. And not only that, you can also, you can well, you can also relate uh, energy momentum conservation directly in the S frame and the S prime frame. Okay, so uh, more of that a little later, but then to summarize what we have um, talked of, of uh, three vector and a four vector, um, let us just spend two more slides on it. Uh, for a three vector, uh, so let us say the velocity vector, the radial vector, things like that, okay, a three vector of course has three components. So, we put a vector sign on top of that and a four vector of course will have four components. Okay. Now, why is it that we call this three component thing as a vector by the way? Well, it, it is because if you, um, if, you, if you are changing your um, coordinate system okay, and then you are following uh, you know the change of coordinate system uh, is due to is the, the change of coordinate system um, is due to this transformation. You need this transformation matrix R to go from one coordinate system to another. And similarly, uh, in this case of four vector, it's the Lorentz transformation which is transforming from S to S prime. Okay. Now, a vector. I mean, we define a vector to be that to be that physical entity. Is that uh, look at uh, the uh, the three vector part okay so if you look at the three vector part and then you see that x vector x is transformed to vector x prime okay now it's the same transformation matrix which will do the transformation so the uh, transformation matrix which is uh, transforming um, a coordinate system o to o prime okay the same transformation matrix will be responsible. It is the same transformation matrix which will transform x to x prime. Okay. So, that is a vector. Okay. Not only that, the length of this vector in the O system and the length of the vector in the O prime system will be preserved. Similarly, uh, what you see is that uh, it is a Lorentz transformation which is transforming the quantities in the S frame to the S prime frame. Okay. So, uh, it is the same Lorentz transformation which is going to transform the components of uh, the four vector in S frame to the components of the four vector in the S prime frame. Just like the transformation matrix R uh, transform uh, the components of the vector x in O system to the trans components of the vector x prime in the O prime system. Okay. And just like the length of the three vector was constant, here what you see that the squared norm is Lorentz invariant. Okay. So, that gives you an idea why we had used this uh, word vector for um, this four component uh, entity in special relativity. Okay. Now, of course, there are lots of applications to, to, to uh, using four vectors. Uh, we, we have just been introduced to two of uh, the four vectors. One, of course, is the space-time uh, four vector, and another is the uh, four momentum uh, four vector. Okay. Now, these are going to have applications in in relativistic kinematics and uh, and things like uh, relativistic collisions. So, uh, let's uh, talk a bit about um, such a thing about our coordinate systems in, 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 a, in a case where such collisions can happen, uh, namely the laboratory and the uh, center of mass system. So, what is it? So, basically we are considering the collision of two particles A and B let us say. Okay, they are of certain, uh, they are of rest masses M A and M B. Okay. And uh, let us say that um, well, you can you can look at this either in the laboratory system and the center of mass system. Well, in case um, you want to know what um, these systems are, uh, the lab system is one in which one of the particles is at rest and the other comes and hits it with a certain momentum, you know, certain momentum, let us say three momentum, okay, p or a vector p. In this case, let uh, particle b be at rest and then particle A is moving 
uh, with a certain momentum in the lab frame, uh, P A L, notice the vector sign and then the subscript A L, L stands for the laboratory quantity. So, whenever you see this L, it means that it is the lab quantity. So, in a sense, what is the momentum for vectors here? Well, capital P A L, that is the, we will, we will read four quantities. The first quantity relates to the energy uh, and it, well, it is basically the dimension of momentum, it is but uh, involves the energy, that is E A L by C and then the three uh, vector with which or the, or the momentum with which uh, the, um, the particle A is moving. What about P B L? That is the four momentum vector for particle B in the laboratory frame. Well, that is E B L by C and then remember it is at rest. So, it is total moment that is the linear momentum is 0. Okay. Now, what is um, E A L? E A L you know that it is M A into C square. Okay. And then what about E B L? E B L is nothing but M B into C square. Okay. Now, remember here E A L, now when I write M A here, it is M A divided by 1 minus uh, V square by C square actually. So, that is assumed within uh, when I write E A L here. But when I write E B L here, remember that it is just the uh, rest mass squared. Okay, so, we um, conclude our discussions um, here today. Uh, once we have seen the differences um, between uh, the three vector and the four vector, now we realize why we call it as a four vector itself, um, keeping it, you know, some sort of consonance with this um, component of a three vector. Okay, we're going to see in our next topic uh, the applications of this of the four vector in um, in in special relativity, especially in relativistic collisions. And uh, we'll also do some more uh, problems in uh, in relativistic kinematics in our next uh, discussion. Thank you very much.